You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello and welcome to WCAT, the Catholic Bookworm. I'm your host, Kiki Latimer, and I have with me today Father John Cush and Monsignor Walter Oxley, um, who've written a wonderful book that I'm very excited about, Theology as Prayer. And it's a, it says a primer for the diocesan priest. Um, but of course, I'm going to argue that it's also a wonderful book for the laity as well. Oh, great. Um, it's just, uh, I just loved it. And um, so, Monsignor, you want to start us with prayer, please? I will. Thanks, Kiki, for having us. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, please send your Holy Spirit upon us today for all of our listeners and watchers. May this be an experience of a deeper encounter with your son, Jesus. And to help us see, too, how our intellectual life, how our reading and our study can be so connected with you, Father, living God, that the Holy Spirit that whom you send can bring us into deeper communion with your son, Jesus, through the written word through the intellectual works of these great theologians of the church's tradition. And we ask that Mary seat of wisdom intercede for us as well and be present to us. Amen. 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 Father, son and Holy spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you. So um, before we get started, I'd like you both. um, You've sent me your bios. Um, Father Kush, you are in Dunwoody, Yonkers, New York, and yes, Monsignor did. Oxley, you are in Toledo, Ohio. Exactly. Um, could you take uh, take turns here and tell us a little bit about yourselves? Yeah, Father Kush, go first, please. Sure, sure. <laughs> My name is Father John Kush. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn in New York, and uh, Brooklyn is the smallest geographical uh, diocese in the United States. It's also the only completely urban diocese in the United States. It, it's two boroughs in New York City, Brooklyn and Queens. And um, I, I am 24 years, thanks be to God, a priest. And um, I serve currently as a professor of dogmatic theology at St. Joseph Seminary and College uh, for the Archdiocese of New York. And um, I teach sacramental theology, ecclesiology, um, um, Christology, and fundamental theology. And um, I've been a parish priest. I've taught um, high school full time as a priest for eight years. Um, and I was academic dean of the North American College in Rome uh, for seven years. So I'm really happy to be back in New York and really happy to be with you today. Well, anyone who's taught high school is a brave soul. So. <laughs> He's good. He's a good teacher. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Monsignor. Okay, Kiki. I Thanks, Father Kush. So... I was working in the Roman Curia at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in my previous assignment. And that's where Father and I wrote this book together because I was a spiritual director at the North American College. So he was the academic dean at the North American College, and I was living across the hall from him as a spiritual director. And so we worked together and had a close relationship and professionally and also um, socially there. And Currently, I am the Senior Director of Clergy Consecrated Life and Vocations for the Diocese of Toledo. So I, I uh, assist Bishop Thomas in, in, the, um, in help with priests and deacons in terms of uh, assisting them in their lives and their ongoing formation and, and their needs. And, uh, and then on the Bishop's Senior Staff and, inclus- and, and assist him very closely in administrative works here in the diocese. So I've been a priest 19 years. Thank you. So the two of you wound up during the pandemic, I understand, in Rome together. Correct. Right. And that's how the collaboration of this book came about? It it was. It was. I mean, we, we, we would talk, Father Cush and I would talk a lot about theology because when you're in Rome and you're Americans, you know, you're, 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 um, you're, we live in a, in a, in a college there that's apart from, you know, uh, uh, other Italians and things like that. So you're, you you spend a lot of time together 
in this American college conversing uh, in English. And uh, we talked a lot about uh, theology and priestly formation together. And it was Father Kushka's idea. He's like, we should, we should do a book together. And he just kept encouraging me. And it really was an incredible experience. I certainly couldn't have done this without him because he has the um, capacity to say things uh, succinctly and accessibly. And uh, so, and I wanted to, this topic of the intellectual life and the spiritual life is such a, an important topic for me. And I've always wanted to start to talk about it more. And he really gave me the opportunity to be able to speak about it more. So the two of us together, I think are just really proud of this book. And, and well, you, you should be, it's wonderful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> In so fact, much. um, I, at the end of my home for the homily book, I have a list of suggested readings and, um, hopefully by next week, Sebastian will add this, um, to it because it's wonderful. It's thank wonderful. I'm, yeah. I'm really grateful for you saying that Kiki. And I, I'm really, I'm really grateful too from you saying that from the perspective of a lay person, because that's really an added um, fruit that we didn't necessarily expect. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So the fact that, that you read it and, and had fruit from it is really encouraging to us. And it just shows that this probably could be a gateway for a lot of other people theologically, you know, uh, I- Absolutely. I, on page, I was really happy because I, on page 31, you said the faithful will see that theology may also become accessible to them in the same manner. Oh, beautiful. Um, And to me, that was exciting that you added that line. Um, because I do believe many of the many lay people, um, need to access theology and, um, you offer it in such a wonderful way in your book. Um, yeah, it's it's accessible, isn't it? It's it's it's, it's an accessible, accessible way to read theology. That's what we wanted. <clears throat> a brief, succinct, accessible way to read the theologian yourself. Right. And um, encounter God 25, with that. Yeah. Right. About 25 years ago, my husband and I and a, a couple of friends started what we call the Summa Theologica Wrestling Group. Oh wow. In Providence, Rhode Island. And and our thought was that we could, you know, we'd spend maybe a year or two reading the Summa Theologica. Uh we met once a month over, you know, wine and cheese. And um we finished it twenty five years later. Um wow. <laughs> we're now That's on brilliant. the uh, um so it was fun to see, of course, to St. Thomas um in your list of, of ten theologians suggested for uh for study. Um, but, you know, again, made very accessible. Um, we were fumbling around like complete idiots our first year. And then we luckily, um, found some people that were teaching, I believe, at Providence College who came and joined us and helped us sort of. Oh, nice. Lead our way through the beginning of the Summa Theologica and yeah. sort of gave us our wings a bit to figure out how to do it. Scholastic um, reading is not the easiest <laughs> thing to do, is it? But once we got the hang of it, we've had a we've had a great twenty five year run with it. We've had a blast. Um, That's have great. Loved it, and we've had many people sort of come and go over those twenty five years. But we've had a small core of about five people that have hung in there with us. Um, that's really encouraging. That's what we wanted to do. You know, that's a primary source. You know, you're yeah. you're going straight to to Saint Thomas himself, reading him, and then mm-hmm. engaging him and praying with him and seeing how you are engaging theology and, and, mm. you know, and, but and your book makes it more accessible and gives you a little window into why, you know, um, the, the 10 people that you mentioned, the, why these guys are like some of the best to start with, I think is really helpful for priests and lay people. Thanks. Yeah. We love the diversity because it spans the whole tradition of the church. That was important for us to not, yeah you know, sort of have a particular period in the church dominate. You know, we didn't want the scholastic period to dominate. We didn't want contemporary theology to dominate. We didn't want the patristic period to dominate. We wanted to show it all from the year 108 to what, 205. (laughs) (laughs) So that's, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, 
yeah, we, we're pretty excited about that. And we, we thought about that and talked about it together. You know, which theologians are we going to use? We went back and forth. Of course, Father Cush is a Lonergan scholar. He did his doctorate on Lonergan. So we wanted to make sure that Lonergan was in there. And Lonergan can be very rather dense in many ways. So um, he's kind of hard to understand. But the way we did it is it really allows people to see him, you know, in a, in a readable way, I think. You know, this Lonergan's kind of one of these theologians where only like the brightest people are kind of engaging him. And, and the same thing with St. Thomas often, too. You know, it's like, yeah. how do just nor- regular people, you know, engage Thomas or regular people engage Lonergan? Right, right. Yeah. I had never heard of Lonergan, um, but I was interested particularly in one thing that you that you quoted from him. He said, the solution has to take people just as they are. Mm. I, I was fascinated by that line. There's a there's a German expression you may know. Um, Man muss die Menschen nehmen, wie sie sind, under a Gipsnitz, which means you have to take people as they are because there aren't any others. <laughs> Um, so that idea, I have it certainly in my homiletics book of, of knowing the people, taking people where they are, knowing their hearts. Um, yeah. A lot of your book, a lot of your book touched on the idea of really getting to know people as they are. I'm glad you picked that up because that's an important piece for Lonergan. It just, he just understands the existential so well. Yeah. And, know the and, sheep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's part of his genius. So that Father Cush knows a lot about, more about Lonergan than I do. I don't know much about Lonergan, but I know a little bit enough to, to, to engage, you know, and that's all I need to know because that's right. what, what this book is about. That's why it's called a, that's why it's a primer. Well, you talked about, you used the word authenticity, mm-hmm. which is a beautiful word. Um, that's very often. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, Lonergan, very right. often our, our, you're saying you're trying to put together the intellectual life and the spiritual life, and very, very often they get separated. We, well said. See, and that discourages us as formators, where there's this, this, this chasm between, like, you have to be like this intellectually elite person, you know, to, to do theology. And it's just not the case. Like, it, and it's just, we're trying to overcome that chasm and that that that's that that it, overcome it and that this book i think really does that and that's what excites me about it so and in- that's my biggest push <laughs> go ahead no no please i was gonna say that's my biggest push in homiletics is getting priests and deacons um to be real to be authentic to be honest instead of like some highly intellectual mm-hmm. bizarre <laughs> theology just be real with us you know, be vulnerable, that, that authenticity that touches people's hearts. Um, and I, you know, even though I know the, like the Summa Theologica is terrifying to most people just to hear the words, um, yeah. it's such an exciting, fun thing to read, you know, um, all of it was, even the crazy stuff like how many angels are in the head of the pin and right, why, right, right, right. And I just love it. <laughs> But he gets real, you know, did people poop in paradise? You know, <laughs> you, you, you can ask the question, it's in the Summa Theologica, and people don't realize how much right. fun it is. <laughs> Absolutely. The program so one of the questions, Father, Father Kush, one of the things you mentioned to me was the difference between what you call internal and external formation. Do you right. want to discuss that with me a little bit so our readers know what you're what you mean by sure. this? Sure. Um, well, just to start, uh, just to follow up on what you and Monsignor had been mentioning, it's important for us to realize um, that the holism is what you need in priestly formation, a holistic individual, someone that takes all four dimensions uh, that Pope St. John Paul II spoke about in his um, post-Synodal exhort- exhortation, Pastor Dabovobis, um, the human formation, the spiritual formation, the intellectual formation and the pastoral formation. And what Monsignor was saying about that chasm that sometimes can exist, even among the brightest students, between the intellectual life and the life of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, and the spiritual life and the pastoral life. And so that's something that I've always, as a professor, um, I try to emphasize to the students. 
you are as a priest, as a priest, you may not get asked like early Christian doctrines and things like that. Like, why does Arius teach this? But your knowledge of Christology is going to come out uh, in the way you preach and the way you celebrate the sacraments. So you may not, every priest has to be trained as a, as a theologian, even if he never is a formal theologian. But to answer your question, really, the notion is uh, the church wisely <laughs> divides the formation team into what they call internal fora, uh, internal forum and external forum. The internal forum would be that for a seminarian um, of a spiritual director. And that could be, uh, that is a priest whom they meet with usually about once every two weeks. And they have the opportunity to talk about all aspects of their life, but especially their growth in, please God, in the virtues and holiness um, and an integration of uh, who they are as an individual and their, their own vocation. Or, um, and that's what uh, Monsignor had done at the Pontifical North American College uh, so well for us over there. Uh, I, on the other hand, was what they call an external formator. Uh, so um, I would vote on the seminarians as a formation advisor. Um, I had to not necessarily be the disciplinarian, but to watch and um, get to know the man and kind of give almost, if you will, the nihil obstat on the candidate, the same way a censor of books gives a nihil obstat um, over a text saying, yeah, this is ready to go. And I recommend this to the bishop or uh, in terms of a book, but in terms of the seminarian, as the agent of the church, I recommend him for ordination or unfortunately, I think that we might have to uh, delay his ordination, give him a pastoral experience or oh, and discern with the seminarian as well. So that's really what the external formator did. And um, my particular uh, role when I was in Rome was as academic dean. So I helped coordinate the, uh, the student's education intellectually. But again, it's not just, if you think about it, for the seminarian, the intellectual formation is only one fourth of where they're at. Because you can't, nemo dot quad non habit. You can't give what you don't have to mention a scholastic axiom. If you don't, if you don't have a, a, a solid, grounded human being, you can't develop a spiritual life with God, with all right, and his, and then you can't learn about the Lord and His Church well enough, and you can't give what you've been received intellectually, spiritually, and humanly out to anyone. So that was really kind of the goal. So the role of the external formator and the internal formator is to come together, um, and again. A, an, an external formator has to be able to say things and he can't hear confessions of the seminarian where an internal formator uh, can't really say anything about what the seminarian is saying to him, uh, you know, because it, it may involve the sacred reconciliation and some other aspects. So, yeah, so that would be the main difference. But see, anything you want to add to that in terms of internal, external? Just the fact that we're we're bringing those together and it, we're, we're kind of I mean, a, a number of formators, you know, rectors try to bring these things, these two dimensions together, Father, as you know. And mm -hmm. but it's 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 difficult sometimes, you know, because people want to divide the spiritual from the intellectual. And and how do you actually bring these two things together in your actual concrete life? These two dimensions, these two critical dimensions and. Because, you know, you, 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 there's a, there should be a dichotomy between a, a spiritual priest or an intellectual priest. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we're that's what we're cutting through here. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you have a seminarian who's thinking, oh, yeah, I just want to be, you know, prayerful and holy. And then he's not interested in studying. But but then what's going on there? Like, you're not interested mm -hmm. in studying like that's part of this wholeness. Father Kush is talking about yeah. that. You, 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 you need both. I mean, the hope would be that the intellectual is informing the spiritual or the holiness. Correct. And then the holiness informs how you learn in the intellectual. It should fuel. The holier we become, we should want to, of course, serve Jesus and our neighbor more. But we should also <laughs> want to read more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the more I love you, the more I want to know about you. Right. The more I love anybody, the more I love somebody, the more I want to know them, get to know them. So 
That's right. The more you love God, it would seem that the more you want to know them. Now, I've heard lay people say, I learned everything I needed to learn in CCD. You know? And, <laughs> and that's, like, no. that's, kind of, that's kind of sad, isn't it? It's because sad. Yeah, it's yeah, so sad. sad. Yeah. Um, because it's so exciting to learn new things about God. Um, Correct. And that's one of the exciting things about having this this interviewing job is it, it pushes me to read things. I could get really lazy because I live on a beautiful pond here oh, wow. in Rhode Island, and I can get very caught up in my birds and squirrels. Um, uh-huh. So this pushes me to read, you know, at least one theology book in addition to my continued Summa Theologica studies. Um, but with my degree over, it pushes me to continue reading and. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more exciting than to read something new about God. Good, exactly. Um, and there's or, grace in that. Oh, there's just, it's, you know, it's better than pizza. <laughs> right. And it shows your maturity. It shows your Christian maturity. And, 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 you know, when we come across a priest who is either too intellectual or he's, he's, he's spiritual, but He's kind of a dumb bunny. That's right. It shows, um, you know, when you come across a priest that has both, you the laity knows it. They may not be able to put it into words, but they know. You'll hear people say, like for here, here, you know, many people will head to Mystic Rhode Island for Father Kevin um, because his homilies show that he has both this amazing intellectual life and Mm -hmm. an amazing deep holiness about him. And people run to that. You know, his daily mass is packed every day. Wow. I um, hope he went to the North American College for seminary. Uh, uh, or at least know, Dunwoody late... or the Father of the <laughs> Poor Dunwoody. <laughs> he's a late vocation priest. He used to run oh, okay. nightclubs in New York. Um, right. oh, Father wow. Kevin Riley at, uh, in St. Patrick's in Mystic, Connecticut. Amazing. But, That's... you know, we, we see it. We see it. We know it when it's there may not be able to say you may not put it in the same words that you guys would put it in but believe me the laity knows when it's oh sure Um, again it's that authenticity uh mm -hmm. that's called for and and if you look at the notion of who each and every one of these um theologians whom we've discussed in um in our book they're all in love with god as you say yeah, right. that's, the, that's the main source. And remember, when we get to the fathers of the church, I was just telling the seminarians this today in the class that I have for fundamental theology, doing a little bit on St. Cyprian of Carthage. He was, um, St. Cyprian and all the fathers of the church weren't writing scholastic, they weren't writing systematic theology. They didn't sit down there to get published. They're responding <laughs> to the spiritual and pastoral needs of their people. And so even when we read something like De Trinitate, or from St. Augustine on, on the Trinity. That's really him trying to explain as best as he can the Trinity to the holy people of God with, with whom he's been blessed to be their bishop. And that's kind of exciting. And because mm-hmm. we're connected as, as priests to our bishops and the bishop is the chief teacher, that's why every priest, as I think I mentioned before, has to know this material. It has to be able to express it in a simple way in his homily three to five minutes on a weekday or five to seven, like the Holy Father says on a Sunday. And uh, that's kind of exciting. Yeah. And you mentioned having to know the questions that your people are going to come to you with. And they differ from parish to parish. Um, But there are basic questions. I'll tell you my own sad story. Um, I was not brought up Catholic. I got reeled back to Rome. (laughs) many years ago now, but um, my mother was brought up Catholic and um, she left the church, I believe, probably maybe around the age of 25. And I wish I knew the whole story, but um, the part of the story that I do know was that she went to her parish priest with three questions. I'd give my right arm now to know what those three questions were, because I bet I could answer them with my degree in moral theology (laughs) and my study of the Summa, but I don't know what the three questions were. My guess would be maybe a theological question, and then, you know, was the time headed towards a sexual revolution, maybe a contraception question. I don't know. That would be my guess. But when she went with those three questions, her parish priest said he didn't have the answers, first of all. (laughs) And second of all, he told her, you don't ask questions, you just believe. Hmm. And that was that, and she left. 
Um, so I was, so she left, so she was not married in the Catholic church. And, uh, so our, we children were not brought up Catholic and, um, oh, wow. but Jesus found me and <laughs> reeled me in, oh. you know, St. Peter reeled me in and got me to cross the Tiber anyway. But I often, your book really brought that story back to mind, you wow. know, um, you. how much was lost by a priest who couldn't answer three <laughs> Three questions. Right. Yeah, and I think we, do, we I think about St. John Paul II, you know, and how masterful he was, you know, at the at you know presenting and transmitting the faith. Yeah. And you know, Father Kush is mentioning him. He's really the founder of of priestly formation as we know it today. Yeah. And this integration between intellectual and human, you know, you talk about authenticity. It's that Lonergan talking about authenticity that's worked out in the depths of the spiritual life, you know, with God himself and with, you know, through the mediation of your spiritual director. And that's where you start seeing these things all together, come together. And you don't see it any more gloriously than in somebody like St. John Paul II. Right. Who's really a master at both. Well, both my husband and I came into the church under jp2 oh beautiful um with also the guidance of we always call him the rat our our beloved rat singer oh good mm-hmm. <laughs> you know there was a rat in uh c.s lewis reap a cheap i don't know are you familiar with reap a cheap in the c.s lewis chronicles of narnia mm-hmm. um, there- so we always we always referred to uh benedict as the rat because nice. we just loved him <laughs> nice. but his writings chesterton's writings um but john paul's beautiful face um, was instrumental in bringing us into the church. You could see his, both his intelligence and his holiness in his face. Mm -hmm. Correct. And uh, the the spiritual dimension of the person that, that shows in the face always amazes me um, when those two things come together. It's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And he was our father Cush and I, I mean, he was our, he was our, 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 our guide, you know, our, he, yeah. we, our fa- you know, a father to us I mean, because we lived in Rome with, when mm-hmm. he was Pope and were formed under his, yeah. under his fatherhood. And so just, it's, it's had a huge impact wow. in our lives Absolutely. and we're, we are who we are in no small part because of him. And his example of yeah. other saying of being a great intellectual but at the same time, being a man who is deeply prayerful. And if you think about it, St. John Paul II had a desk in his chapel. Yeah. He had a desk in his chapel and would write. I mean, when you think like, um, I remember asking um, um, Archbishop Reno Fisichella when he was just um, Monsignor Fisichella, um, so the uh, newly ordained auxiliary bishop uh, for Rome. And I had him in class as a, young priest in Rome for my licentiate uh, at the Gregorian University. And I asked him who wrote, uh, what philosophers and theologians wrote uh, Fides et Ratio. And he looked at me and he said, the Holy Father wrote every word of that encyclical. Wow. And that idea, you think about that beautiful, brilliant encyclical. Brilliant. Masterpiece. And it was written before the Blessed Sacrament. Wow. And integrating who he was as a person seeing the pastoral need, going before the Lord and writing. And in that sense, I mean, the other example we could use is St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Being able to take everything that he's, he's done in his life and the needs that he responded to in his writing of the Summa Contradentiles or the Summa Theologia, which as you know, as we know, was meant to be like the brief summary of theology, if you can imagine. (laughs) And Thomas is able to say at the end of his life, Nothing but you, Lord, nothing but you. You know, what What do you want most in your life? No one has ever written as well as you have on my Eucharistic body and blood. But yeah. what do you want? Nothing but you, Lord. And that's kind of exciting. And if in any way we can help the the seminarian, the diocesan priest, or the um, lay person try to integrate that um, those aspects of their lives, that's really, I, I think, our wish with... Uh, Theology as prayer. Amen. Well, well, I think the the little you gave you go over ten theologians. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Balthasar, Rayner, Lonigan, 
the Lubeck, who I want to get back to eventually here, Bonaventure, Aquinas, uh, St. Ignatius, St. Maximus, the Confessor, JP2, right. of course, Benedict. Um, so you have these, these 10 great, amazing, amazing people. Um, and you, your book gives us several pages about each of them. Just great, um, I don't want to say tidbits, but um, mm-hmm. teasers. Right. Um, wonderful teasers. Um, a, a few of them I was not familiar with and found myself going, ooh, yeah, I got to find out about this guy or that wow. guy. Um, love that. Um, so your book does give us these, these teasers to um, you give great introductions to each of them, who they were, what their strong points were, um, suggestions as to what to read. And uh, I want to talk, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, basically, Father Bonsignor Ar- Oxley and I got together, and I remember it was a Saturday morning, uh, and we sat down, like, who are the people that we're reading? Who are the people that we think might be? And we deliberately picked um, some theologians that I don't necessarily use in my classes, like Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner, even though I may not agree with everything that he does, I, um, you know, in terms of his approach, He's still a very important theologian and which so many people have grown to know the Lord through his work and, and grow in their spiritual life. So that's how we pick these different people um, for that reason. Some of them were obvious, if you think yeah. about like St. Thomas or um, or St. John Paul II or Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, some of them maybe not as obvious. Int- introduce some of the um, folks out there to the idea of who these wonderful <clears throat> saints, wonderful theologians really are. And so that was kind of the exciting part about choosing choosing who they are. And so the way we did it is I gave, I wrote the little intros and Monsignor was our professional prayer, if you will. So those reflections are all his. So he took those readings that we both came up with. So all I had to do is write the intro, who they were, and <laughs> everything else in terms of his approach uh, of, of the spirituality using that Alexio approach that uh, both of us and many of us, maybe our listeners and um, and viewers are also familiar with Lexio <clears throat> Divina. That's what we try to apply right here. Right. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really glad we got to Lubach and, and Balthazar in there. Mm-hmm. Those are two of my favorite theologians and they have such an impact on me and such an impact on, you know, in De Lubach's case, the Second Vatican Council, and and uh, and and on Saint John Paul II, and on Pope Benedict, and just to to, to be able to engage them like this in prayer uh, was real considerable for me. I, I just I love their influence. I love the Communio School of Theology. I love its contribution to the Church. I love the Second Vatican Council and its texts and. And, you know, Delubach is a, a major part of that and, and is just, you know, contribution and, and thought and, and, and helping explicate it as well. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that, that was exciting for me. That period is particularly exciting to me, you know, just pre-conciliar, post-conciliar, Second Vatican Council, uh, because I've been so influenced by that period in my own formation. And I would agree oh. with Monsignor on that. That's... Um... That idea of ressourcement, going back to the sources of divine revelation, of sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Uh, those men really became, um, I just to speak for Monsignor as well, our theological guides, people like Balthazar, people like De Lubach, people like Ratzinger. So that's yeah. what makes it so much fun. Yeah, and Ratzinger and- himself was influenced by De Lubach, you know, and 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 so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice. And you just think about Joseph Ratzinger and how he was able to intellectually engage so deeply with all, with theologians from diverse schools in, 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 in such an effective way. Yeah. That's, he was a master, masterful at that. He and was all, very, all the, to the magisterium, you know, that's the, the genius of Joseph Ratzinger. He understood he, the Second Vatican he, Council better than anybody. Yeah, sorry, Kiki. That's right. His yeah. his writings were so accessible. He was so instrumental in our conversion. 
I mean, I love John Paul II, but his writings are, are much less accessible than Joseph Correct. Ratzinger's were. Um, just, just so instrumental in our intellectual formation, which became our spiritual formation, becoming Catholic. Um, you also quote Bishop Barron a lot, who. Um, oh, yeah, it's Father John. We're big fans of Father Gush. <laughs> and um, he works closely with Bishop Barron. Oh, he's oh, he's just delightful. He's a great delight. He's been we we use him for our um our prayer group here for the last um I guess about ten years, and you know we've gone through all of his films and everything. And he's he's just been what a, what a brilliant man too. And he's also makes Catholicism so accessible to people. Um, you know, really, really zeroing is. in on beauty. You know, truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, starting with beauty, he's he's just been great at that. Um, and you quote him quite a bit. And on page 48 here, um, he talks about the Dalubach option, which I had never heard it expressed like that. But that this finding the center, um, mm. you know, not going off the deep end <laughs> on the left or the right. Right. Um, which, of course, like he in your quote from him, he says, you know, just look at any Catholic social media and you see people off the deep end on both sides. Um, sure. Jim and I, of course, um, we deal with that on social media all the time and, you know, know people in those side groups um, and trying to keep people pulled into the center. And, and I didn't know it had a term like the Delubach option. It's, but. it's a term that's, that uh, Bishop Barron had used. And again, it's a takeoff of what uh, Rod Dreher suggests as the Benedict option. Uh, really, uh, if you've ever heard of his book from 2017, the Benedict option, meaning not Pope Benedict the 16th, but Benedict Saint Benedict of Norcia, of pulling away from society um, in order to preserve, you know, uh, Christian identity. Uh, but really, that re is not what um, at all what um, the uh, the Delubach option would be a Delubach option is to be able to see grace playing out in everything to be able to to embrace the uh the world to see the world yes as fallen but redeemed and it i think that's the great gift of uh all of those thinkers joan you had um I can't get rather, you had mentioned before that you found john paul ii's writing so accessible I'm the exact no, not accessible. Not, not accessible. accessible. Not well, accessible. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, because I find like, like Benedict to me, like I, I loved. I don't want to compare any of the popes, but his book Introduction to Christianity, by by, by as Cardinal Ratzinger, oh, yeah. nine is just an amazing text. That's and just I really guess. encourage that to all, anyone out there watching or listening, mm -hmm. if they want a good introduction. It's just a beautiful text. Good spiritual read, too. No, yeah, I find Benedict very, or Ratzinger, very accessible. J.P. Right. too tough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's exactly how I, <laughs> I would feel. Like, wow. I mean, some of the stuff, it's so dense, but so beautiful. And you can see I, the mystical quality of Pope John Paul II. Right. I've heard there's some kind of a joke that, you know, in Russia or somewhere, you know, if a criminal is sentenced, he's given a choice between, you know, 10 years hard labor in the mines or reading the acting person. Oh, wow. Gosh. <laughs> and no one has ever chosen the latter. <laughs> oh, wow. That's and you can joke about that with Karl Rahner, uh, who obviously was a German. He would write in German. He had a brother that was a priest and a church historian. And his brother allegedly said he waits for his, uh, for his brother, Karl, uh, for his his brother Carl's works to be translated into English so he can begin to understand them. He just couldn't <laughs> understand his own brother. Complex stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course, John Paul II's theology of the body, I personally consider the most brilliant thing written since the Summa Theologica. Wow. That's, I mean, to me, it's just that like, that is brilliant. Wow. It really is. Um, but it's tough. It's tough to weed through it and, uh, because of his writing style. Um, it's so, genius, though. He's a philosophical master. Yeah. I mean, but I you the we'll, theology of the body and fetus at ratio, I mean, both of those, from a philosophical perspective, I mean, are just unbelievable. Just, just amazing. Yeah. There's so much, um, you know, you talk about, you know, you can't give what you don't have. And there's, we have this amazingly rich, tradition i mean this amazingly rich catholic library 
um, that touches also about uh, on philosophical works um, that aren't necessarily specifically Catholic, but don't disagree with Catholicism. We have this huge, rich, amazing um, books at our fingertips, especially in, you know, in this age of printing and, and this age of being able to access things online. I mean, every single thing that's been written, I can get on my smartphone. You know, right. The entire Summa yeah. Theologica is on my smartphone. Yeah. You know, it's, um, there's so much available both to priests and laypersons um, that is not being accessed. And, mm-hmm. and I think your book really encourages um, both priests and lay people to start to access um, and gives us a starting point. Um, your your suggestions really give people a starting point. If um, especially if they feel like they don't, a lot of people we feel like we don't have enough time. Time's that <laughs> big, the big mystery of time. Um, I have plenty of time for my screens, but my Facebook, but theology. And I think there's also a sense a lot of people think theology and philosophy is boring. Um, they have no idea. They'll say, oh, you go once a month for 25 years to all the way to Providence to study the Summa Theologica. Wow. It's like, yeah, but you have to say, yeah, but we have wine and cheese. You know? Right, right. <laughs> That's what draws them in. But ultimately, it's being drawn in by the truth that the very task that St. Thomas tries to give. Right. That's yeah, beautiful. There's such joy in learning something new. Um, I think sometimes we forget that. Mm-hmm. Um, and your your book. I think is a, is a nice quick rem- It's, it's not huge. Sorry. That's another reason. It's, it's not a huge, very book. readable. Yeah. Uh, it's very readable. And it's, it's a nice quick reminder of the joy of, of learning and that it's through learning that we can become holier, that we can become more connected. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's, right. it's just a, a fun book. One of the things you mention in it, I've got it here somewhere. Know the faith, express the faith, defend the faith. Um, I know a lot of people more or less know the faith. They can kind of express the faith. No way can they defend the faith. Hmm. Um, you know, when I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in the abortion issue, have been for many years now, wrote the book, helped write the book, Understanding Abortion. And a lot of people, a lot of, you know, well-meaning pro-life people know the issue mm-hmm. and sort of express the issue, could never defend the issue. Um, right. And so they especially like pro-life politicians who get themselves into some corner that they can't get themselves out of, you know. Um, talk to, I'd like you to just talk about the importance of being able to know it, express it, and defend it, the faith. Yeah, but Senator, do you- what would you, your thoughts be? Well, I mean, this is the new evangelization, what we're formed in. It's, um, you know, when, when we, when we want to, when we're able, when we share the faith with others, it shows the fruits of what's really happening in our interior life. Like if this, if this prayer and this study was just for me, there would be something gravely missing in my in my spiritual development, in my call to transmit the gospel. So this, this book gives me a way to speak to people more about prayer and more about the truth of Jesus Christ. It's another, it's another way in for me. And, um, and so, you know, I need to be expressing that publicly and sharing that with people. And it, and it comes out and hopefully it comes out in my preaching too, which is also a, a sharing and defending. Um, yeah, and I do my best to intellectually defend. And when I, when I, when I have a stumbling block, you know, and I can't quite get the right words to, 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 to defend, you know, I can always, uh, have somebody else help me, you know, (laughs) or, you know, call on somebody that's, is more of an expert in the exact kind of way to describe something. But my, my often, my, my defense of the faith needs to be this credible witness of Christ um, that is, that is both spiritual and intellectual and, and at the, at the same time. And so that would be my thoughts on that, Kiki. Yeah. I think it's important to defend the faith in a non-defensive manner. We know the truth. We have the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. And it's our role 
just by who we are, how we live. You know, St. Francis, um, it's attributed to St. Francis, I should say, preach the gospel always, use words <laughs> if you need to. And I think that's important for us to remember. We don't have to be on a soapbox all the time. And again, the vocabulary, the theological vocabulary, I, I you mentioned before, like, um, I think most people know their know their faith. It's we have to trust the census fidelium, but we have to go beyond, you know, just a simple um, explanation of the faith to really give that rational defense, uh, that rational mm-hmm. apologia for, uh, for for what we believe. So yeah, it's kind of exciting in that sense that be to look for that and um, to to say it's not just well the Bible tells me so because that's really a form of fundamentalism. <laughs> But we need to take into consideration the sacred scripture, sacred tradition, uh, what our church teaches, and not only that, but why our church teaches what she teaches. Mm-hmm. Right. It's been fun to see, to watch Bishop Barron go to places like Google and Amazon and, you know, these very secular places and in his extremely charming manner defend the faith. Like you're yes. saying, not in some defensive way but in some purely delightful, joyful invitation to the faith as, um, as a rational yet faith and rational and faithful place right. um, yeah. of, of worship. He, he does a great job of that. He's a real leader in that. And I, I think the Pope even called him or referred to him as like a Fulton Sheen, you know, to compare him to Fulton Sheen, which is quite a compliment. I mean, it's that kind mm-hmm. of, charism that bishop Barron has yeah. and you know the leaders in the church are looking to him for for intellectual support i would say and yeah, and, and you know and he's really able to provide that for us right now at a critical time yeah, yeah. And he's a great that. delight he, he and I, I i love how he um he started he started everything with beauty his catholicism series he began with beauty um, and goodness, and then he moved to truth. And I always say that's the that's the direction to go. Always start with beauty. That's he, right. a, a little child understands beauty. Absolutely. You know, so he took us to the cathedrals of the world, which was a great joy, and um, and really shows the beauty and 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 the intellectual life is in itself beautiful. Um, it is. And your book brings out this this joy that can come from the intellectual life. Oh, um, you know, I know people think I'm crazy, crazy when I say the Summa Theologica was, is, has been fun. Um, and, and fun sounds like a very trivial word sometimes. Um, but it has truly been both a great joy in that deeper sense, um, but it's also just been fun. <laughs> exactly. I had to choose yeah, between is. Six Flags and um, the Summa Wrestling Group. I'd, I'd head for our wrestling group, and um, we have wrestled at times. Um, we've wrestled with concepts. We've oh, wrestled, sure. Um, you know, we've had some some heated Summa Theologica sessions over sure. the years, um, but it's it's been a great joy. And um, of course, we live in a culture that sort of downplays the intellectual. Correct. Yeah, it's feelings based and right now in the culture and we're losing, you know, the rationality, yeah. essentially. And so it's important that we we keep reading and but it's yeah, it's a very feelings dominated and, and feelings need to be integrated with reason. You know, emotions yeah. need to be integrated with reason. And and uh, a recognition, like you say in your book, that if if things are rational, then your feelings actually get better. It's not that you get rid of feelings. It's that you improve feelings. Correct. Um, Absolutely. You know, so we're not trying to get rid of feelings. Absolutely not. But but to improve them and make them much more crystal clear. and, and Precisely. That your feelings are beautiful rather than, you know, a shipwreck. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because right, feelings are an integral part of prayer and emotions are an integral part of mm-hmm. prayer and that comes out in our book too, you know, in these, in the, in the meditations that, you know, these are heart-based meditations in the spirit. So you have, uh, you, you know, the emotions and feelings and the whole human person involved with that, which is necessary too for, 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 for credibility, for Christian credibility in today's world. Like you can't have Christianity without, you know, the, the human side, 
And it's not, you know, we're not robots. Right. Let's talk about that. I I wasn't thinking about it at the moment, but I I want to get to that. Your book is very practical. Um, You mentioned keeping a journal and then you do have the meditations and I I glanced through the meditations. My plan is to actually do the meditations. Um, So I didn't read them, you know, end to end, but I did glance at them and plan to actually do them. Um, so talk to us a little bit about these meditations that are in the book and, and what you hope they accomplish for people or help people yeah. accomplish. What I would like is for a, a parish priest to be interacting. What we would like is for a parish priest to be interacting always with theology in some way. And the way that's accomplished is, is with the, the the meditation period the priest has each day, uh, you know, a, a, or a, a, a holy hour of prayer, as Fulton Sheen would talk about, that we promote in the seminary. So how do these two things come together? When you're praying as a priest, sometimes it can be rather dry and rather difficult because of whatever factors may be. And what the theologian, when the theologian steps in, it can help draw us out of ourself mm-hmm. and lead us into the, the, the real truths of, of, of the faith. Being a, like I'm somebody when I pray, like I need help often. I mean, I'll, I pray with scripture and, and the Lord can speak to me through scripture. And, and that often have really good prayer experiences on my retreat with scripture and journaling with scripture and pure Lexio Divina in the traditional way. But outside of the retreat each year, uh, I find that I, I need help often and I need things to buoy me up more. And so the theological text um, is a help to me. So if I had this theological, if I have a theological text in my office, it also keeps me oriented towards the spiritual and the intellectual and not towards uh, um functionalism or workaholism or sloth, but it keeps me in grace more. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to help the parish priest see, this is what we're about in priestly formation, Father Cush and I, right. we're trying to help the parish priest see that he needs to, to, to remain and live in the intellectual and how basically he can use his prayer period in the day to do that. To combine it. To combine it. Yeah. They, yeah. You, there, it can be porous there you, between your intellectual life and your spiritual life. They, can, they should inform each other. And, and so this journaling becomes helpful because you don't want your prayer period to become overly didactic, you know, overly analytical. You want it to be a heart-to-heart encounter with God. So that's why we, we go through these different phases of, of – um, of Lexio, the traditional phases of uh, Lexio, Ratio, Meditatio, and Contemplatio, because it basically simplifies the intellectual. It simply it makes it from more analytical, which is what a theological text generally is, to more relational, which is what prayer is supposed to be. So we're bridging that. We're bridging that for you, and hopefully, it helps you to bring the Summa more into your prayer. Right. Right. To just take one little spot of the Summa and just meditate on it for a for a longer period of time. Yeah. You know, in your own often, personal prayer. Yeah. There's often when you read something that's very intellectual, there's often a line or a paragraph that stands out more than Precisely. the others. That's what happens um, in scripture too. Right. And what we're saying is we're broadening this traditional approach to Lexio to say, okay what strikes you or sticks out in your mind and what's striking, how is the spirit striking your heart in this theological text? God can also do that when you're walking through a, a a national park, Mm -hmm. you know, he can strike your heart with this beauty or being on a starry night, you know, with the moon and a beautiful moon and, you know, he can strike your heart. And so we're saying, look, he's doing the same thing. He's laboring to love us. Great. In the theological text. And that's, that's really helpful for seminarians because seminarians have to do a lot of reading. 
And so Father Cush has already experienced, and I've experienced other seminary rectors being very interested in what we've done here. Because any seminary rector is really concerned about this. You know, I, they want them to like to read and like to study, right. and they want, it, they want these men to be integrated. Right. Well, I'm certainly concerned about it when I teach homiletics. Um, mm-hmm. Of bringing those two things together, correct, to bring, and that's you know, it. The intellectual that's it. and this—that's I, I, always a concern, you know. That's it. it. It's kind of funny. Every once in a while, when I start with the lecturing practicum, um, they shake in their boots because they know at some point, you know, they'll just—it's just the lecturing practicum. All I have to do is proclaim, and then I'll stop and I'll say, "Okay, give me a homily on that." <laughs> Seminary, it'll be like. This isn't homiletics. This is this is lecturing, and I it's said, lecturing. Yeah. But yeah, can you can, do you have any thoughts at all on what you right? Just you want them to deep read? It, right? And it's mm-hmm. like oh, and I said, is there nothing in your heart about what you just read? <laughs> right, said, right. Because there isn't. If there isn't, what are you doing here in the Precisely. seminary? <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's <laughs> and it. then they'll say, well, let me think. You know, yeah. you think, what's in your heart? What's in your head? Bring the two together and say something about the text, the, the gospel reading you just read to me. And it's amazing what's there. You know, you can bring those things together. And mm-hmm. eventually a, a seminarian who wasn't prepared will come out with something beautiful. Thank God. Um, you know, something wonderful um, when you bring the, the intellect and the heart together. Um, and again, to be able to express that, we we need that expressed in 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 the homily. We need it expressed in in like you're saying in people's lives. You know, we we look at how we look at how our priests live. Who is he? Um, mm-hmm. But also for lay people, you know, who are you in your life? You know, <laughs> just so um, bringing the intellect and the and the holy living together. You know, it's like you said, you you, you could have a holy priest, but if he's a dumb bunny. <laughs> right, right. Or you could have somebody that's really, really smart, but they're not that holy. That's right. You want, that's what, want those two to come together. That's right. That's what priestly formation is all about. That's what Father Cush is doing at Dunwoody. Yeah. And in this point, that's in a little time advertisement church, for Dunwoody right there. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> so, no, at this point not. in time, the church desperately needs priests um, that are doing your book, <laughs> bringing those two those two things together. And really bringing them together, ultimately, for that pastoral outreach. So it's not, remember, when we study, when, when we pray, when we study as priests, it shouldn't just be for the sake of ourselves. Correct. That's right. How do we communicate that to the people of God, to the bride of Christ? I mean, the yeah. Lord is the bridegroom. We're the friends of the bridegroom. <clears throat> how can we assist the bridegroom and feed and helping and, and curing and and loving his bride. And that's really what we, uh, we, we're trying to do. Right. And then once we receive it, we have to do the same thing, that outreach to our neighbor, our outreach to children, to grandchildren, to our community, to the world. <laughs> um, so it's so important. It's so important um, for both priests and laity. Um, so I highly recommend your book to both. Thank um, you. Even though I know it's it very says encouraging it's a <laughs> it's a primer for priests when uh when it gets put out again i wanted to say a little and the laity <laughs> right second um, edition second yeah edition. institute for priestly formation is oriented towards priests and seminarians so yeah. we kind of fit with our publisher there and, right. and that. yeah Very well great. i did the same with my homiletics book it's it's primarily for deacons and priests but it can also be used by the laity in giving retreats and talks and Excellent. outreach as well. So my religious, uh, my religious women, the Vietnamese women at Holy Apostles are reading it and telling me they love it. And it's, wor- you know, it's helping them with their talks as well, even though it's directed to homiletics. Um, What's the title so, of your book, Kiki? Home for the homily. Good. Okay. The idea is that the, uh, the homily has four homes. It starts in the home. It's, it's home in the mass. That has to fit in with the mass. It has to be at home in mass. Then it has to move to the home of the intellect of the person listening to it. Oh, nice. And then it has to move to the home of the heart. You have to love the homily, love something that you've heard. Hmm. And then it has to move to the home, the domestic home of the will. Okay. You have to be able to bring the homily home. Um, if the homily's gone by the time you leave the parking lot, it's 
a pointless homily <laughs> has to make it all the way to its fourth home. So Thank you. I'll make sure it, I order your book and use it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, 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 and it, it's, um, it's everything that I was teaching at Holy Apostles combined with almost everything that the more recent popes have written about homiletics um, are in there. And uh, yeah, love teaching homily, but that idea that the homily has to have a home, it has to make it from the mass to the intellect, to the heart, right. to the domestic church. <laughs> That's right. I love it when people say, oh, Father, I loved your homily. Um, but by the time you get home and say, well, what was the homily about? And right, like, right. I don't know. I don't re- it was good, but I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it made it somewhere from between the intellect and the heart, but it didn't make it out of the parking lot. Oh, my gosh. My, my, true. my hope is for homilies to have a strong enough central point and image uh, and joy, goodness, beauty, truth in it to make it all the way home to be lived out in some way during the week or the month or the year to come to make a difference. If the homily doesn't make a difference, then it's just been... <laughs> A lot of waste of time, you know. So you want that grace to make it home. Absolutely. So that's uh, home for the homily. Okay. Let's look at that. So, is there anything else you would like to share? There was so much I wrote down, so many things, but I know we are running. uh, Well, we've gone about an hour. Um, This has just been delightful. But is there anything else that's really important to you about the book that you haven't mentioned? I would like to thank Deacon Jim Keating, who is um, uh, a really fine, fine man. Deacon Jim Keating is a a professor of spiritual theology at Kendrick Glennon um, Seminary and had been um, the academic coordinator and now is the um, coordinator for the Institute of Reasoning Formation um, Press, their publications. And he had contacted me actually in 2018 to write the book. And I kind of put it off and put it off. And then, and um, I want to thank Monsignor Oxley for being my, uh, my writing partner and really being the guinea pig. Uh, the <laughs> did the meditations. And I really am very grateful to, um, uh, to, uh, to Monsignor and to Deacon Jim, but also to uh, Ms. Michelle Funke from the um, Institute right. Formation publications because without um, their efforts, I don't think we certainly we wouldn't even have thought of doing this book. And um, correct without their help, it certainly wouldn't have come to fruition. So I'm very grateful to uh, to Michelle and to Deacon Jim, but I'm especially grateful to my very good friend Monsignor Oxley, um, the fruit of a friendship of many years, um, based on based really in the love of the Lord, love of the Church, and love of study. So thank, thank you so much, a- Monsignor. Likewise. It's amazing how many people and circumstances go into the Holy Spirit yanking a book out of us. Uh-huh. <laughs> to me, really? for me, it took the pandemic. I kept saying, I've got to write down what I'm teaching. Um, oh and it was not teaching. Um, and the, the year of the pandemic that got me to write the book too. So, and you Actually, guys got thrown together during the pandemic. We right? did. Yes. Yeah. So it was the same um, in many regards. Yeah. So, then- so the- the so, Holy Spirit's ways are not usually our ways. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, right. Well, yeah. thank you. This has been delightful. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you for a wonderful interview. It was yes, delightful you. for us. Father thank Chris, you. would you like to end us with prayer? Certainly. And what we'll do is we'll commend ourselves to the Holy Mother of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou, thou among women. Blessed, blessed is the fruit, fruit of thy womb, thy Jesus. womb Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us, pray sinners. For us sinners, now, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Pray for us. Father, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kiki. Thank you, Monsignor. Thanks Thank you, having Father. Having Blessings you. on your teaching today. Thank you. This and has been delightful. Ministry. Really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. 
Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.